This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was glad when they sent to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He has shown thee what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel here in Crampton Auditorium. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. We're going to ask Ms. Robin Houston, a member of the Friends of the Chapel, to come at this time to light our unity candle. Thank you. Let us stand for our call to worship. Lord, we know that goodness and mercy shall follow us. Together, for all our days, we will worship in the house of the Lord. Amen. Please remain standing for our hymn of praise, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand.
You may be seated. We will now have the readings from our scriptures by Erica Middleton, our graduate assistant, and Reverend Dr. Kanika McGee, the special assistant for interfaith programming. The Old Testament reading is Psalm 91, verses one through six. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare and of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings, he will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. This morning's New Testament scripture reading comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. But as for you, person of God, shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To God be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. At this time, if you have a call to worship, please, excuse me, a call to chapel, please meet us behind the stage for your announcement. Um, on the beginning, on the front of this morning's bulletin, you will find our social media. If you can please connect with us on there, as well as subscribe to our YouTube on, at Rankin Chapel. And you can also find Dr. Daniel's um, social media on his bio. We will now welcome Glenn Vaux III, our chapel assistance president, who will lead us in our calls to chapel. Good morning, chapel family. Good morning. We have two calls to chapel this morning. The first call to chapel comes from Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Alpha Chapter. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Alpha Chapter, we would like to welcome this morning's speaker, Reverend Dr. Darius Daniels. We, along with the Howard University community, are extremely excited that you are joining us today, and it is both an honor and a privilege to have you deliver a word here at the Mecca. Our next call to chapel comes from Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated Alpha Chapter. Good morning. On behalf of Alpha Chapter Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, we would like to formally invite you to our 2019 Delta Week entitled Restoring Our Roots, Reaching Optimal Opportunities Via Tangible Sagacity. Our week begins with today's call to chapel and will end on Saturday, October 4th, 2019. Please join us tomorrow for our first program of Delta Week entitled Credit Score, Strategically Constructing Opportunities to Repair Our Economy. Would the 2019 Delta Week Committee please stand? <clears throat> the 
What all sorors initiated at Alpha Chapter Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, please stand. And would all members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated please stand. We would like to extend an invitation to join us immediately following chapel around the flagpole on the main yard for a moment of prayer. Thank you. Next call to chapel we have is from the Howard University Homecoming Day of Service. Good morning, Chapel family. My name is Clara and I serve as the Executive Student Coordinator for Howard University Homecoming Day of Service. We invite all students, faculty, staff, and alumni to participate in our annual Homecoming Day of Service this upcoming Saturday, October 5th. The link to sign up is located on the inside of your bulletins. Would all those who have participated in Homecoming Day of Service in the past please stand? Thank you. I want to, uh, and can you stand? They are dressed in their traditional garb because Tuesday is Nigeria's Independence Day. So let's give God thanks. Thank you to everyone that had a call to chapel this morning. Now for our quote of the week. I suggest that we pay as much attention to our nurturing sensibilities as to our ambition. You are moving in the direction of freedom and the function of freedom is to free somebody else. And that's from Toni Morrison, class of 1953. Thank you.
let us prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. Let us be still before our God. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. O God, may clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O Lamb of God, that take us away the sins of the world. Grant us thy peace. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's anything in me that is getting in the way of what is for me. Then lead me to a place where I may become what you had in mind when you created me. Search us, O oh God. Search even in the hidden places. Come to where our painful disappointments and our greatest fears are hidden. Come to where we hurt. Come now with your healing touch. Come so that we can dream again. Believe in ourselves again. Come so we will no longer allow any failure, person, or situation to steal from us our confidence. We will not allow anyone to make us feel small or undeserving. Come, Lord, so that we can forgive ourselves. Come so we can forgive and be free. Come, Lord, and, and help us to, to let go and to move on with our lives. Come and so that we can see and, and thank you for the many ways in which you have already blessed us. Search us now, God. Search us so that we may know what our hearts are longing for. We often don't know what we want. So in this moment of prayer, we, we give to you our confused thoughts, our, our misguided ideas, and, and our many contradictions, and ask you to show us the way. Give to us this morning. Give to us strength, courage, Give to us wisdom to, to see and to choose what is true and, and what is good for us. We ask for faith to trust you, to trust ourselves, and to believe, oh God, that our tomorrows will be better than our yesterdays. In this moment, oh God, in this 
in this very moment, help us to believe that all things are possible. Our healing, a new way to live our lives are possible. For with you, all things are possible. This morning, we, we pray not only for ourselves, but for the people in our lives who need more than we can provide. We place them in your care now, Lord. We place in your care all who need healing. We place before you our poor, all who are in prison, all who grieve, and all who know the pain of loneliness. And then, oh Lord, we, we give you this nation, our very sick nation. Free her from her hatred and, and bitterness. Free her from all the contradictions and all that you desire for her. Free her from those who want to take us back to a way of life that is against life. And free her from all who do these things in your name. Fill, O oh God. Fill each and every one of us with compassion. Let it be like a fire shut up in our bones, making us unable to look the other way or to tolerate the pain and injustice being inflicted upon all who you love, especially your children. Now hold us, Lord. Hold us in your love until we learn how to love. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
first I want to say that the Howard University Bookstore is present with us, and they do have literature on sale from our speakers, including Dr. Darius Daniels' book, Represent Jesus. We have now reached the offertory period of our worship service. We would like to thank Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated for joining us this morning as greeters. We now welcome the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel Choir under the direction of Dr. Eric Poole. They will sing our offertory selection, I Will Sing Praises by Richard Smallwood.
also like to thank the ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated for serving as our ushers today. We'd like to thank all of the organizations who have had a call to chapel this morning. And thank you for your service, not only to Howard University, but also to our broader community. Uh, this morning, um, our graduate assistant, Miss um, Cynthia Railer, said um, it's a little nervous because I told her that she had to lead the service today, and she said she can't. Something to that effect because her parent, <laughs> her family's here. So I said, oh, that's good pressure. <laughs> so I'm going to ask her family to stand, Reverend Isaac A. Fox. We're, oh, fantastic. And her, that's her grandfather, her granddaddy, and her grandma, Jesse B. Fox. And her mom, Angela F. Wheeler. Where is she? Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your daughter with us. This morning, our preacher will be assisted by Ms. Akia Austin. Please stand. And Zakia is a junior psychology major Africana Studies and Human Development Double Minor from Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> By way of Nigeria, right? <laughs> Thank you. We are indeed blessed this morning to have as our preacher the Reverend Dr. Darius Daniels, founder and lead pastor of Change Church with locations in New Jersey, Florida, and California. Uh, Dr. Daniels has a vibrant ministry that impacts people of all ages, socioeconomic, and ethnic backgrounds. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Millsap College in Jackson, Mississippi, MDiv degree from Princeton Theological Seminary in Princeton, New Jersey, where he's also an adjunct professor and a Doctor of Ministry degree from Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Uh, Dr. Daniels is a certified personal coach with a versatile gift, versatile gift and speaks frequently in seminaries and churches throughout the nation. He serves on the Board of Directors for the National Association of Evangelicals. He's indeed uh, a unique voice in our church today and not only is a great preacher but also a great pastor. And we give God thanks for the ministry of Reverend Dr. Darius Daniels. And following a, a selection from the chapel choir under the direction of Dr. Eric Poole, we will be blessed to experience the preaching and the ministry of Dr. Darius Daniels. Please pray for him as he comes to lead, give us a word from the Lord.
Can we say amen together? If you believe that God is your all in all, and you are because he is, one more time, can we put our hands together this morning? My philosophy is this praise is the most intelligent thing I do all week. It makes sense to show gratitude to the one who's been so generous to me. Is that anybody else's testimony this morning? Man, I'm so, so glad, so excited to be back at the premier Howard, the <laughs> The, you know, I tell this story every time I come here, and I'm going to tell it every time I come here. I wanted to get my doctorate here, but I think my application was so bad, they didn't even send me a response. <laughs> my Lord. Uh, but uh, one day, one day, one day I'm coming to homecoming, and uh, that's going to make up for everything, because uh, I heard... Howard's homecoming is lit. I love Jesus and litness. I still do. I believe in theology and litology also. So, uh, so honored to be here. Just so much respect and admiration for Dean. Your genuineness and generosity and you're so affable and kind and caring and there are students all over the world who will be indelibly impacted by his life and his leadership. And so, so glad to be here with y'all. And uh, uh, shout out to, just in case there's anybody in the audience that happens to be a part of the greatest fraternity in the world, those distinguished debonair dukes that wear that old, that black and that old gold. I just just in case there are any members of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, I want you to know you're extra anointed today and God is well pleased with you and uh, we're glad to be, <laughs> glad to be here. I brought a couple of leaders from our church uh, who are here and uh, Courtney Wells and uh, Big D Donald, I want them to stand up. One of them's married, newly married, the other one is single and uh, I just thought I'd throw that in the atmosphere just in case God moves, amen. And so I wanted to throw, throw that out. One correction I wanna make to uh, something on my bio, it's a bit outdated. It doesn't matter to you, but it matters to me. Uh, I have not been a part of the National Association of Evangelicals since 2016, amen. Since 2016 since 2016. Amen. Okay. Just one. <laughs> Should be quick. Okay, so there's there's something on my heart I'd like to share it uh, and so I want to call your I want to call your attention to um, a, a book that is actually in a section of scripture that's called wisdom literature. The Bible is not organized in chronological order. It's organized according to section and genre, somewhat similar to the way books are organized in a bookstore. And so Job falls in a place and in a space in scripture that, that we call wisdom literature. Now, if you're from the old school, you, you call it job, because that's, that's the book of the Bible you give to somebody when they need one. But uh, Job chapter 1, um, verses 20 and 21, is where I want to call our attention. I want to invite our intellect there this morning. I'm going to read from the New International Version of the Scriptures, so your version of the Bible may be the same, but the essence of what's being communicated here um, is going to be consistent. Job chapter 1, verse 20 and 20, uh, 21 says, At this Job got up, tore his clothes, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will repart, depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. 
I've used the book of Job in this context before I preach from Job here at Howard. But I want to take a look at a different part of the story, and I want to tag a different title to this text as we prepare for our discussion today. And I want to talk to you about surviving stressful seasons. Is it midterm week? <laughs> huh? I, I want to talk to you about surviving stressful seasons. As we prepare to go swimming in the pool of this passage, navigate our way through this narrative on today, I want to inform some and remind others of an, the existence of an emotional epidemic that is adversely impacting the lives of most people in culture and many of us who are seated in this sacred space on this morning. It is an epidemic that is invisible and intangible yet undeniable. It is ubiquitous. It is aggressive and it in some degree affects everyone I am talking about this emotional epidemic called stress. It is indiscriminate. It does not discriminate. It will turn into whatever neighborhood you live in, gated or not. It will jump the gate find your street, pull into your driveway, walk up to your porch, ring the doorbell, come in uninvited, sit in your living room, go to the kitchen, drink the Kool-Aid, and not even know the flavor. I'm talking about stress. S the student is stressing about taking the test. The teacher is stressing about grading it. Somebody's stressing because they don't like their job. Someone else is stressing because they can't find one. Someone is stressing over the wedding. and Somebody else is stressing over the divorce. Somebody's stressing because they can't find the house and somebody that they want. And somebody is stressing because they can't sell the house that they have. Uh, somebody is stressing because they can't stop losing weight. Somebody is stressing because they can't stop gaining. Somebody is stressing because they want children and can't have them. And somebody is stressing because they're struggling to raise the children that they have. All types of people in all types of seasons are struggling with stress. Somebody say stress. How, however, 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 I've got some good news. I said I've got some good news. And, and the good news is this. Although to some degree we will all have stress, the good news is stress does not have to have us. I'm going to say it one more time. That to, although to some degree we all will have stress. The good news is stress does not have to have us. I believe the book of Job contains some practices and some principles that will help us put our stress under arrest and the first practical principle I believe that's contained in this powerful passage here in Job is this principle of perspective. I believe it's so powerful and profound because Job's story is a powerful picture of a reality all of us deal with and questions that all of us have. And here it is. How can a God that loved me let life keep stressing me? This, this book of Job addresses, it is really a book that addresses and it wrestles with the tension of something we call theodicy. How, how can a good God allow bad things to happen 
to good people. Let's not sanitize the story. If you're familiar with Job's narrative and we don't read it properly, God can seem to be insensitive. God can seem to be disconnected. God can seem to be an accessory to the crime of evil. If you believe like I do that God is the ultimate epitome and expression of good, it means he's incapable of evil. It means that whenever evil happens, he does not cause it, but he can redeem it and use it. Yet, if you believe as I do, he's sovereign. He's got ultimate power. Other people have a say, but God's got the final say. Other people have power. God's got ultimate power. If you believe that, then we also have to conclude well, God, even if you didn't do it, you could have stopped it and you didn't. What's up with this? And I know very often in spaces like this, we don't give ourselves permission to ask those questions. We act as if we don't ask, have those questions. And the truth of the matter is, with people that I have conversated with who defected from the faith, many of them defected from the faith because we didn't have the courage to confront the reality of questions like this. So when life happens to them, they don't have a perspective that allowed them to be anchored in the midst of a storm and they walk away from a God that they don't believe is who God says that God is because how could a God that loved me let life keep stressing me? You could have stopped it, but you didn't. And part of it is because this issue of perspective that somehow we have leaned so much into certain parts, passages, and segments of scripture that we do not paint a realistic picture of what God says we will ultimately and inevitably deal with in life. Let me paint a picture for us. The Bible says in this world we will have tribulation. That's what God says. He says as long as we have residence in this world, we must be prepared to endure some inconveniences. That's, that's what God says. Number one, that's the case. That's the case because we are imperfect people. And because we are imperfect people, that means we make imperfect choices. And there are some storms, I'm going to see where the honest section is. There are some storms that we go through that are not a result of the enemy. They are a result of the inner me. There are, where's the honest section? Yes, yeah, that there are some things that the devil did not do I did it right every decision is pregnant with the potential to produce a season and there are some seasons we walk through because of some decisions we made sometimes we suffer because of me I'm imperfect not not only not only is that the case with us we we are imperfect people right but we are also, this is, this is interesting because it is, it is the backside of the blessing of community. We are imperfect people, but secondly, we are impacted by the imperfections of other imperfect people. Think about that. That's the backside of the blessing of community. This is, this is the way a wise, a sage named Solomon put it. He says... Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. He didn't say, I have to be a fool to be harmed. He said, I just have to hang with them. Because sometimes, is that too honest? Sometimes, sometimes we are impacted by the imperfections of others. We, we become imprisoned by their dysfunction. It, it's, it's the backside of the blessing of community. The, the same heart that becomes open to love is the same heart that has also opened itself up to injury. Every parent should have said amen there. The, 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 the same child that brings you tears of joy 
can be the same child in another season that brings you tears of heartache because love makes you vulnerable, not just to pleasure, but to pain. And sometimes other people happen. You didn't do it, they did it. This, this happens personally and it plays itself out in society that we as a people have been impacted by the imperfections of others. People who were in positions of power with views that were not grounded accurately in scripture views of supremacy and segregation and those sinful views became legislated into policies and practices. So it is not only sin in the hearts of people, it becomes sin that exists in laws and in practices and consciousness sin that exists in the hearts of people that occupy places of power sin that ultimately and inevitably impacts who can go to school where who can get a loan there how wealth is distributed to certain communities sin impacted by the imperfections of others we happen other people happen this is the tough one because this is Job's story we're imperfect others are imperfect but we also live in an imperfect world where creation does not function in a way that is consistent with the creator's intent. And so now nature behaves in ways that are unpredictable and sabotaging and destructive and for reasons we cannot comprehend, at atmospheric variations create hurricanes that hover over places like the Bahamas and we have no, no, no rational explanation as to why it just happened to happen then and there. Why? Because all of creation is groaning and moaning and waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So earthquakes happen and tsunamis happen and hurricanes happen and fires happen and mudslides happen because all of the created order is, is affected by the imperfection that exists in the world. So sometimes you suffer and the only thing you did was live in a city. You just happened to be in a city that got flooded. That's, that's all some people did in New Orleans with Katrina. They just did nothing but live in a city. Suffering. But I've got good news. Now, I grew up Baptist. When I say, when I do that, you're supposed to say, amen. Okay. I got good news. Yeah, yeah, I, I got good news. See, the, 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 the good news is the Bible does say some suffering that produces stress is inevitable. But that's not all it says. It does say in this world you will have tribulation. But that's not all it says. It says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. It, it does say many are the afflictions of the righteous, but that's not all it says. It says, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. It does say weeping may endure for a night, but that's not all it says. It says, but joy will come in the morning. I, I, well, well, maybe you're not feeling that. My grandmama used to say it this way, trouble don't last always. And is there anybody here that can testify this morning when you look back over your life, you've had some suffering, but in the middle of your suffering, you found a savior that came and rescued you and delivered you and brought you out and brought you over and brought you through and made a way out of no way and parted Red Seas and knocked down Jericho walls. Is there anybody honest enough to say that I am here today not because I've been good to God, but because God's been good to me. You stressed, but you made it. You cried, but you made it. You were confused, but you made it. You didn't know how you were going to make it, but you made it because the Bible is clear that 
you and God have a different set of eyes. That you can be looking at the same thing and not see the same thing. The Bible says in the book of John, there was a man by the name of Lazarus who had died. And Jesus told his disciples, Lazarus is sleeping. Because what looks dead to you is just sleeping to God. Did you hear what I just said? I said some stuff you think is dead. God's like, all I got to do is say his name and I'm going to wake it up. Because we don't see things the way God sees things. There's a man by the name of the Apostle Paul who had a thorn in his flesh. He said, God, I want you to remove it. <laughs> and God looked at it. He said, you know what? The devil sent it. I allowed it. But now that I look at what it's doing in you, I like it. The devil sent it. I allowed it. But now that I look at what it's producing in you, I like it. So instead of altering it, I'm going to give you grace to endure it. My grace is sufficient. Because, Paul, you saying, I've never been worse. And God's like, that's if you look at it from one angle. He said, but if you look at it from another angle, you've never been better. Paul's like, Lord, I've never been in this much pain. And God's like, Paul, you've never been in this much prayer. <laughs> Paul's like, God, I've never been this stressed. God's like, Paul, you've never been this spiritual. Paul's like, God, I've never been this burdened. And God's like, Paul, you've never been in your Bible like this. Good news is the gospel is not a gospel of avoidance. It's a gospel of overcoming. God will help you overcome. And we've got the testimony of scriptures that corroborate my claim. And we've got the testimony of our ancestors that corroborate that claim. That we will not avoid everything. But what God does not allow us to avoid, God will give us grace to overcome. <laughs> because if God be for you, who can be against you? Is there anybody here that knows he's more than the world against you? He was more than slavery. He was more than Jim Crow. Come on, talk to me, somebody. If God be for you, he's more than the world against you. So since it's inevitable... Now listen, in my church, I preach 25 minutes because we got multiple services. I'm, a, I'm going longer with you, so I'm giving you 30. I got eight minutes left. Here it is. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. So here's the question. Pastor Darius, if it is inevitable, if I'm going to have stress, what practically can I do besides prayer? which is often the religious answer that's given when we don't have an answer. Hmm. What can I do practically besides prayer when I'm in stressful seasons? How do I survive them so that I come out better and not bitter? How can I survive them so that I don't have to medicate myself with unhealthy substances or unhealthy relationships or self-sabotaging activity so that I don't have to send bored texts to bad people to get my mind off this stress. <laughs> how, can I, how can I manage this in a healthy way? Because I, I know how to manage it. I've got ways I've been managing it, but I probably need some more healthy ways to manage it, ways to manage stress that won't make me regret it in the morning. <laughs> what, 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 here it is. These, these are three things I see in Job's narrative, and I won't, I won't go through the narrative. There are three things I see in Job's narrative that I believe can help us. All right, are you ready for him? Number one, Job, who managed a stressful season. I believe his story teaches us. Number one, we read it. Number one, first thing we gotta do is we gotta master weeping. We read it, it's, it's in the text. The text says, 
he tore his robe, which was a sign of mourning. It means that Job was emotionally honest with God about what he was feeling. And this is what I've learned. I've learned this. I've been reading. I've been reading the Psalms, and um, Rev. I'm reading this book on the on the Psalms, and uh, it's called "The Cry of the Soul." And the writer is looking at the Psalms and pulling out the emotional honesty of David. And I am surprised at how honest he was with God about what he was feeling and how we try to sanitize our thoughts before the Savior, because we assume he don't know what we're feeling. He know you mad? Tell him. <laughs> yeah, I started reading stuff. David would say stuff like, I'm tired of everybody. This is the Daniel's version. He said, I'm tired of everybody. He said, I'm tired of everybody. I'm so tired of everybody. If I had wings like a dove, he said, I'd fly away and I'd be at rest. He said, I'd just leave my phone. I would turn it off and I would leave and I wouldn't tell anybody where I've gone because I'm tired of people making withdrawals from me and not making deposits. I'm tired of people wanting me to be there for them and they're never there for me. I'm tired of the only time the phone rings, you're giving me these preliminary pleasantries, and I'm waiting on you to get around to what you're getting ready to ask me, because you never call me unless you're asking me for something. He says, if I had wings like a dove, I'd just fly away, and I'd be at rest. It was emotional honesty. When he dealt with betrayal, he did not allow pride to cause him to act as if he had not suffered emotional injury. He would say stuff to God like, I'm mad. I could show you some stuff that David said in the Psalms, and you would not believe that God called him a man after his own heart after he said it. David would say stuff like, he said, I want my enemies to go to the pit of Sheol. See, yeah, yeah, he, he, he said, he would say stuff like, he was, when he dealt with betrayal, he would say, now, if it was my enemy that betrayed me, he said, I could handle it. He says, but, he said, but it was you. He said, we went to chapel together. That's what he said. He said, we broke bread together. He said, the injury hurt worse when it came from a source I didn't expect. He's honest with God. But then in those moments of honesty, you will see a space in the songs for the musical interlude, the pause for reflection, the Selah. And if you read what comes before the Selah and compare it to what comes after the Selah, you'll see distinction in tone and in tenor. Because it's something about the pause that allowed God to intervene in the emotional space in David's heart that needed to be addressed. See, because he won't heal it, God won't heal it if we hide it. Okay? And, and, so, and so he would be talking one way at the top of the psalm, and then after the Selah, David would say things like, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, and you're my glory and the lifter of my head. Because if we're willing to reveal God is willing to heal. Weep. What does it mean? Not cry. If you choose to do so, fine. Be emotionally honest. God, I'm overwhelmed. God, I'm stressed. God, I'm tired. God, I don't like these people and they have my last name. God, I love my fraternity, I love my sorority, but after this chapter meeting, I'm tired because everybody show up at the party and nobody shows up to the community service project. <laughs> Maybe that was just my chapter, I'm old school. Maybe that's just, y'all don't deal with that. Weep, weep. David was a man after God's own heart because his heart was pure, Job had a pure heart because it was an empty heart. He wept. The 
That's number one. Okay, number two, Job teaches us not only to weep, Job teaches us if we're going to survive stressful seasons, we need to weed. We got to master weeding. Who did Job have to weed? Some of his friends. If you're familiar with the story, you'll remember right in the middle of his suffering, his friends all of a sudden got a word from the Lord. Y'all remember that? Yeah, God is telling me to tell. No, he's not telling you to tell me nothing. God is telling me to tell you that you need to fix your life. Something's wrong. You can't, you can't be experiencing this without there be some error in, er, being some error in your life. Ethically, something is inconsistent. Something is going wrong. And Job's friends were stressing him more. And I believe their inability to be sensitive to his season of stress was a revelation that they are not friends, they are associates. Now, I've got a book coming out in January where I talk about all of that, but I'm going to give you, I'm going to give this to you right now. Listen to this, because the Bible says a friend, listen to this, sticks closer than a brother. It says a friend is born for adversity. I don't believe, I don't believe a friend's commitment is revealed until there's crisis. I don't believe crisis change a relationship. I believe crisis expose a relationship. I don't even really know if you're going to be there for me until it's hard for you to be there for me, until it's unpopular for you to be there for me. Anybody can be there for me when it is easy and popular to be there for me. But many people stress, stressful seasons, aren't managed in a healthy way because they haven't mastered the art of weeding. They don't realize that there are times when you confuse selfishness with stewardship. It's not selfishness to say, I've got to steward the condition of my own soul in this season. It's not selfishness to say, the weight that I am carrying in my personal life in this season makes me unavailable to carry yours too. And some people's stress is made worse. Let me see where the honest section is. Because sometimes stress walk into your life on two legs. Weeding. Number three, my time is up. Number three, Job did some weeding, and number three, Job did some worshiping. It's all in the text. Text says that Job, as he tore his robe, he went down and worshiped. Now, this up on face value sounds like religious rhetoric. Sounds like church colloquialism. Just, you know, give God praise. But two years ago during my sabbatical, I spent the entire month and I studied the human mind because I felt as if I had went through a season in my own life and in our ministry where I saw the danger of a compartmentalized spirituality that does not take into account the psychological uh, renewing of the mind and healing of the heart that has to take place for a person to change. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah. So, so, so I spent the, the whole time, for my own sake, personally and also pastorally, studying the mind. And so I came across this concept called mindfulness. And, and as I thought about where I might see this in Scripture, I thought about Paul's letter to the believers in Philippi, where he is in essence talking about peace. He is in essence telling them to practice mindfulness. He's basically saying, you don't pray your way into peace. He's saying, you think your way into peace. So he tells them, whatever is good, whatever's lovely, whatever is of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Is that what he says? And then he says, when you think on these things, then this is what will happen. Then the peace of God, 
that passes all understanding will rule and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Are you hearing me? Pastor, what does that have to do with worship? Here it is. Worship, which means to express worth, requires mindfulness. Praise requires mindfulness. <laughs> Praise requires that I get my mind off the largeness of my situation and put my mind on the largeness of my God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is the way they said it in the churches I grew up in. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. He says, I start thinking, and then I start thinking, and I start thinking, and I start thinking some more. And the more I think, the more I think. And the more I think, the more I start thinking. And the more I think, the more I think. And the more I think, the more I think. Is there anybody here that's made up your mind that I can't keep dwelling on the largeness of my problem? And I got to start focusing on the bigness of my God because the same God that did it for Job, the same God that did it for Joseph, the same God that did it for Jonah, the same God that did it for Jesus is the same God that will do it for me. Because God wants me to survive these stressful seasons because although I may have some stress the stress does not have to have me Job said the good Lord gives the good Lord takes away but blessed be the name of the Lord in other words no matter what it is it doesn't change who God is I will survive. Put your hands together and give God praise. I think, I think we can do better than that. We're getting ready to praise some stress away in the chapel this morning. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. We're going to open this altar for prayer. And I'm going to ask that we do what the preacher says, to be honest in our prayers. You've heard me say many times our prayers ought to be as messy as our lives. And so I'm offer you the invitation to come and you can just do a sentence prayer to, to the Lord. Just tell the Lord what's going on with you and go back to your seats. The altar is open. Don't be afraid or ashamed to be honest with God. Some are still coming to the altar. I want to remind you that the purpose of prayer is not to notify God of a need. The purpose of prayer is to express our dependency. It is an acknowledgement that God can lift some things off of us that we can't lift off of ourselves. Anybody else this morning?
I stretch my hand to thee, no other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, whither shall I go? God, you've been our help in ages past. I hope for years to come. Your people have come to this altar because they're carrying something they need you to lift. And you said we could cast our cares on you for you care for us. You said if we are weary and heavy laden, we could come to you and you would give us rest. If we could take your yoke upon us and learn from you. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. I pray that you would lift burdens, heal hearts, renew strength, revive hope and faith. Bless us with endurance and patience and tenacity and resolve and resilience and buoyancy, bounce back ability, recovery, that we might be strong in you and in the power of your might. Now may your peace that passes all understanding rule our hearts, guard our minds. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, O oh God, for what eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. And now I said to the one who stood at the gate, give me a light that I may go out into the darkness and into the unknown. And she replied to me, go out into the darkness, go out into the unknown. But put your hand in the hand of God, and God shall be for you better than light and much safer than a known way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.